Okay. We'll just kind of talk. All right, man. Hello, and welcome to Brainwaves. My name is Jim Siegler. I'll be your host today. We're going to be talking about headache, mostly emergency head headaches and thunderclap headaches, the kind of headaches that you see in the ED as a neurology consultant. Today, I've got Dr. Puya Kankanian with me, and he'll be directing our conversation. Welcome, Puya. Hello, Jim. Thanks for having me, man. So you meet a patient in the ED, and they're here for a headache. What is your initial approach? The majority of patients who come in with a headache will eventually have a benign diagnosis, one of the primary headache syndromes. However, you know, headache is a presenting symptom of many deadlier diseases and more serious conditions, the so-called secondary headache syndrome. So I find the one most useful question is, is this a new headache or is this an old headache? An old headache, something you've had for a long time, has been recurrent, is much more likely to be benign, and if so, I can take my breath, take my time, and really think through it. A new headache would demand my closer attention and would require me to rule out the secondary causes in an efficient manner. Okay, so by new headache, typically this means worst headache of life is what you're getting at. I think worst headache of life definitely qualifies as a new headache, but anything that is a change in quality requires some kind of closer attention. So let us next go to a case scenario and then we'll kind of work our way through headache syndromes using a case presentation. Say you have a 27-year-old previously healthy woman who was brought in by fire rescue to the ED with worse headache of life. The severity was most intense at onset earlier this morning and has not improved with time. She's been nauseated, is vomiting, has more difficulty with walking. The patient's able to give you some of the history, but she's relatively non-cooperative due to the headache severity and she's demanding immediate pain relief. What do you think is going on here? So this definitely sounds like a new headache because she's saying it's the worst headache of her life. So I'm already worried. And specifically, this sounds like a classic thunderclap headache. What is a thunderclap headache? A thunderclap headache is a headache that reaches maximal intensity at the onset. The patient will never tell you that. So the way I ask it is in a two-step question. I'll say, what is on a scale of 1 to 10 the maximum intensity of your headache? Let's say they say that it gets to 8 out of 10. And then I'll ask, how long did it take to reach an 8 out of 10? Was it an 8 out of 10 within the first minute, or did it build up to an 8 out of 10? What would you include in your differential for a thunderclap headache? Most causes of thunderclap headache will still be your benign headache syndromes or the primary headaches, but now you've really got to worry about the secondary causes because those are potentially deadly. Perspective studies that showed that between 10 to 25% of cases of secondary thunderclap headache are due to subarachnoid hemorrhage, and that's really the first thing that's on my mind. 10% of patients die before ever reaching clinical attention, and another 40% die before discharge, so you really don't want to miss this diagnosis. Other things to think about are increased ICP headache, pituitary apoplexy, meningitis is another big one that you don't want to miss. What kinds of physical exam elements guide you more towards one type of thunderclap headache syndrome over another? Obviously, a full neurological exam is nice to have in any situation, but if I could pick, say, five things to do on exam, I would do a fundoscopic exam, check the pupils, the extraocular movements, the visual fields, and I would test for neck stiffness. This is easy for me to remember because most of it is basically in the eyes. Fundoscopic exam, you're going to catch your papilledema for increased intracranial pressure. You might catch some hemorrhages, which might lead you to believe that there is some intracranial hemorrhage. Pupillary exam and extraocular movements are going to catch your early herniation syndromes. Visual fields are going to help you with pituitary apoplexy or some of the syndromes such as press or venous sinus thrombosis. And uh, neck stiffness is the best way to catch meningitis early, sometimes even subarachnoid hemorrhage. I wouldn't want to waste a lot of time before getting to the head CT. This is going to be your best test to try to catch your subarachnoid hemorrhage. Occasionally, you can catch a venous sinus thrombosis on uh, the head CT as well. The most commonly thrombosed cerebral vein is the sagittal sinus. On head CT, you'll see the empty delta sign in 30 to 35 percent of cases of thrombosis at this location, which is a poor prognostic imaging feature. It's not seen in the acute period of sinus thrombosis because fresh clot is typically bright, and in the chronic stage, it may disappear due to the formation of channels for recanalization. Other less sensitive head CT features of CVST include the dense triangle sign, which is exactly what it sounds like a hyperintense triangle in the area of thrombosis, the cord sign, which represents thrombosed cortical veins in a linear fashion, as well as cortical and deep hemorrhages with signs of edema or associated infarction. Now, I've been told that a head CT, if it's negative for subarachnoid blood, I should proceed with a lumbar puncture to rule that out for sure. Is that still the standard? 
So that's definitely the teaching that you're going to get in medical school. That's definitely the correct answer on a test. Current third generation CT scanners are quite sensitive with a sensitivity of 95 to 100 percent for detecting subarachnoid blood within 6 to 12 hours. Unfortunately, the likelihood of detecting blood after that decreases a little bit with sensitivity as low as 50 percent after a week. I would still recommend getting an LP if you have enough of a clinical suspicion for a subarachnoid hemorrhage or if you think that the headache onset was more than 12 hours ago where the head CT would no longer be sensitive. And generally, if you're worried enough to get an LP, it's going to help you rule out or rule in some of the other causes as well. So I do think it's helpful. As a rule of thumb, if you're thinking about the LP, you should probably get it. Okay, good to know. And I know that when I do the LP for patients with an aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, I should be looking for red cells that don't particularly clear from tubes 1 to 4. I should also be looking for xanthochromia. Are there any other tests in the CSF that I should be looking for? So specifically for subarachnoid hemorrhage, the ideal test is actually spectrophotometry. Xanthochromia in most labs is performed by a tech who simply looks at the sample and tells you based on the color whether it looks yellow or clear. Spectrophotometry is a computer-aided test which gives you objective data. Unlike the head CT where the sensitivity is going to decrease after about 12 hours, the spectrophotometry has an increased sensitivity after 12 hours. Key drawback of the spectrophotometry is that it's not readily available in many places and when it is available, the results don't come back very quickly. And you did mention earlier that performing a lumbar puncture, even in patients when an aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage is not highly suspected, it can be helpful in diagnosing other causes of thunderclap headache. What kind of results would you expect in those cases and what diagnosis would you entertain there? Yeah, absolutely. An LP is going to help you with your infectious or aseptic meningitides or potentially CNS angiitis. What you're really looking for there is the protein, the glucose, and the cell counts, um, and that can really push you towards thinking about infectious causes, and if you are thinking about infectious causes, what uh, subtype of infectious causes you're thinking about. Other things you want to get in the LP are the opening pressure, which can help you diagnose either a high pressure or a low pressure headache. What kinds of headache syndromes occur with high pressure on the lumbar puncture? When I think about high pressure, I think the things to think about are bacterial and fungal meningitides. Those will usually be slightly elevated. Uh, if you find a very high opening pressure, then that really makes you think about cryptococcal meningitis, and you can send off an antigen test to test for that specifically. Okay, great. Let's return to our case and see where it takes us. On exam, she's mildly hypertensive and she's tachycardic, but her neurological exam is unremarkable. Hypertension and tachycardia are kind of nonspecific signs of pain, so that's not necessarily pushing me in one direction or the other. We often wish the neuro exam would help us, but in this case, it's unremarkable. So what about the head CT? normal. Well, that's good. That virtually excludes an aneurysmal rupture, intracerebral hemorrhage, pituitary apoplexy, and any kind of large intracranial mass. Still left on the differential are meningitis, cerebral venous thrombosis, spontaneous intracranial hypotension, dissection, or stroke potentially. By the way, I hate how I even included stroke in that one, but maybe we can answer that at the end. So how would you like to proceed? So now that we don't think it's an intracranial hemorrhage, we have a little bit of time to think about some of the remaining diagnoses. I think there are a lot of equally valid frameworks for thinking about the remaining diagnosis. I personally prefer to group things based on what I think the next appropriate test is. You can do a lumbar puncture, you can do arterial imaging, venous imaging, or potentially an MRI versus sitting down and getting a much more detailed history. If there's a fever, other signs of sepsis, neck stiffness, or a strong concern for subarachnoid hemorrhage, say for example a patient with an INR4 or a patient with known aneurysms, then I'm going to go for the LP. Uh, key things to rule out before the LP is a large mass occupying lesion, which you've done with the CT, or intracranial hypotension or a colloid cyst, which are both evaluated with a pretty simple question, does your headache get better when you're lying flat, worse when you're standing up? Okay, let me just take a pause for a moment and ask you, what are the other contraindications to a lumbar puncture in a patient without known neuroimaging? When do we have to perform a, a head CT before getting to LP? So there are some criteria that are a little bit old, and they were based on suspected cases of meningitis, but we basically extrapolate that. So anybody with HIV, anybody with a suspected mass with midline shift, anybody whose age is over 65, or anybody with a focal neurological deficit should have a head CT first before doing an LP. And you should uh, take special consideration with people who are coagulopathic, uh, 
or on one of the novel anticoagulant medications. Okay, so, all right, so we'll get back to the, the patient since her head CT was normal, there's no contraindication to doing a lumbar puncture. So what do you do next? So we talked a little bit about why your LP would potentially be your next test. There's reasons why venous imaging might be your next test. For example, if it's a young female smoker on OCPs or a patient with a personal history of clotting or a family history of clotting, then that would be an appropriate next test. If you've got a patient who's been using recreational drugs, uppers or adrenergics, or some over-the-counter cold remedies such as Sudafed and, again, adrenergics, SSRIs and tryptans, the serotoninergics, uh, then I'm going for arterial imaging. If the patient's got neck pain or had an onset during some kind of exertion, physical exertion in the gym, or potentially chiropractic manipulation, those would push me more towards arterial imaging as well. Otherwise, I'm taking a little bit more time to collect more history and get a better detailed exam and consider an MRI. So this patient got a CTA, which showed segmental narrowing of several terminal branches of the left MCA and the right ACA, consistent with atherosclerotic disease or vasculitis. Lumbar puncture had several hundred red cells in the last tube, so how do you interpret this? So the segmental narrowing of multiple branches of multiple vessels is actually concerning for RCVS, or reversible cerebrovasal constriction syndrome, which can be associated with subarachnoid hemorrhage, which would explain the hundred red cells in the last tube. Although the current clinical criteria for RCVS include normal or near-normal CSF, permitting slight elevation in protein or white blood cells, RCVS can cause subarachnoid hemorrhage in around 10% of cases, with younger age and female sex being more associated with RCVS-associated SAH. So the reds in our CSF are supportive of this diagnosis. Some people lump this disorder in with hypertensive encephalopathy, press, and preeclampsia in a spectrum of disorders which are all characterized by abnormal vasoregulation. Like you said earlier, I typically think of the serotonergic drugs like SSRIs and tryptans as drugs associated with RCVS. What other kinds of triggers for this vasoconstrictive syndrome should I be thinking of? Yeah, so in addition to those drugs, uh, any sort of amphetamine, cocaine, any of the upper classes, we've seen a couple cases this year of uh, K2 causing this. Other pharmacologics that have been associated with RCVS include SNRIs, bromocryptine, nicotine patches, IV immunoglobulins, and blood transfusions. Because ginseng and other herbal supplements have also been implicated, you should obtain a thorough history, including use of holistic remedies. I mean, aside from drugs, it can also occur peripartum, which is another reason that people like to clump it together with preeclampsia as part of a spectrum of disorders. Is there a confirmatory test for RCVS? Unfortunately, not really. One thing you can do is repeat the angiography in four to six weeks to confirm that it was a reversible condition. Atherosclerosis, which would look the same on a CTA, should not reverse in that period of time. If there is still segmental narrowing or incomplete resolution, you could potentially be concerned for a CNS angiitis, which can sometimes present with a thunderclap headache. However, the headaches in that syndrome tend to be a little bit more insidious, and they do tend to accumulate some kind of focal deficit over time. It's also often associated with lymphocytic pleocytosis in the CSF or elevated serum markers of acute phase reactants like ESR and elevated WBC. What is the role of calcium channel blockers in RCVS? Calcium channel blockers, like nimodipine, were best studied in vasospasm following subarachnoid hemorrhages, where the earliest trials of these from the 1980s showed a reduction in infarct, though not actually a reduction in vasospasm. Interestingly, the mechanism of infarct after subarachnoid hemorrhage is no longer thought to be due to the vasospasm and probably reflects an underlying hypercoagulable state or an inflammatory state. Sometimes we'll use nimodipine or nifedipine in RCVS, but this actually provides symptomatic management and doesn't actually prevent complications like hemorrhage or ischemia. So let's go backward in time and say the CTA was actually normal initially, but the venous phase was caught on the delayed image acquisition. And your med student actually noticed that there was poor filling of the left transverse sinus, so go med student. What would you do next? First, I would fill out an appropriately high evaluation of the med student. What you're referring to here is cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, and you can confirm that with dedicated imaging. Um, once you're able to confirm that, you can start her on unfractionated heparin versus low molecular weight heparin. You also want to rehydrate her aggressively. Uh, consider antibiotics or anti-epileptic medications if she is showing signs of infection or seizure. Is there any data that low molecular weight heparin is better than unfractionated heparin in these patients? 
there was one small study of about 60 patients randomized to the two different anticoagulants for 14 days and followed with oral anticoagulant for three months. Not only was there greater neurological recovery in the low molecular weight heparin group, but there was a significant mortality benefit. So as long as there is no evidence of bleeding and it is available, I'd start the patient on anoxaparin, especially if she's pregnant, and bridge to an oral agent. Okay, what other diagnostic tests would you do for this patient? So unless she had an obvious trigger, such as smoking a lot of cigarettes and being on OCPs, it's pretty prudent to test for heritable or acquired thrombophilias. Okay, and the heritable thrombophilias meaning factor V Leiden for thrombin gene mutation. What kind of uh, acquired thrombophilias are you talking about? In a young patient like this, I think APLS and potentially pregnancy are things to think about. In an older patient, you might think about malignancy. And in a patient with an appropriate history, the nephrotic syndrome is something to consider, but there are also many others. And when it's not attributed to a hypercoagulable state, what other kinds of risk factors are you thinking? I think dehydration is the most commonly implicated. Uh, it increases the relative concentration of hemoglobin in platelets, making you hypercoagulable. Tobacco use can contribute to Verkau's classic triad by inducing endothelial injury. And one of the less commonly recognized mechanisms is just an idiopathic intracranial sinus stenosis. Since we brought up stroke earlier on in our differential diagnosis, and I really am all about vascular neurology, can you tell me how stroke can be considered in your differential diagnosis of thunderclap headache? So, you're right. Up to 25% of strokes have an associated headache, but this tends to be one with very large strokes, one that you're not going to miss on your neurological exam. Two, it tends to be in patients with a previous history of headache, and it tends to resemble their primary headache. In other words, it's going to be considered an old headache, so it's one of those headaches that I wouldn't have been as concerned about. And thirdly, it actually is rare to have it present as a thunderclap type headache. So in general, I'd say don't count on a headache to lead you to a diagnosis of stroke. All right, that was Puya Kankanian from the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania telling us a little bit about thunderclap headache and the emergency headache syndromes. Thank you so much for your time, Puya. Thanks for having me, Jim. In conclusion, thunderclap headache is described as a headache that reaches maximal intensity within seconds or minutes of onset and then either peters out and, and withers away or it doesn't really get much better. It has a broad differential and the differential can be modified based on the risk factors for the patients. One thing you always want to keep in mind is subarachnoid hemorrhage, particularly due to aneurysmal ruptures, as this has a high fatality rate of 40% during hospitalization. Other things to consider are cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, spontaneous intracranial hypotension, dissections, any expanding intracranial mass lesion, and meningitis. The patient should be emergently taken to head CT, and then from the head CT you can proceed with more thorough neurologic assessment, vascular imaging, the lumbar puncture if you still suspect uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage in the presence of a normal head CT. Once you've recognized the cause, you can figure out the management and go from there. Thanks for listening to Brainwaves today. If you like what you just heard, you can find more related material on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio or contact us at bweditorialboard at gmail.com. Be sure to check out our iTunes archive for older episodes. This episode was produced by Jim Siegler. Music by Simon Mathewson. Join us next time for another edition of Brainwaves. Is a man's copy? Mocha is a man's copy. You're taking it out of context, Frank. Doesn't matter. The whole the whole point of podcasting is to take things out of out of context. <laughs>